Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for part three of the Shanda Share series. I really appreciate if you've stuck this far with me, if you're still here, if you haven't by now given up and said this is too many parts. I really appreciate it because as I've said before, Shanda's story really deserves to be told in its entirety. I have gone through all of the emotions while researching this video, even while just, um, you know, recording it. I've gone through all of the emotions. Obviously, feeling horrible for Shanda, feeling horrible for her family, even at times feeling a little bit horrible for the girls who ended her life. I'm a firm believer of accountability, but at the same time, I am also a human being and I have empathy. So it was definitely a roller coaster while, while doing this series. And I do have to tell you, there's going to be one more part to follow because it's a big story. There's a lot to it and there's a lot that we have to unpack. So grab your coffee, grab your tea, grab your snack and settle in for part three of the Shanda Share case. Before we get started though, I would like to have a word from our sponsor. Once again, I do think we're gonna need one for this video. Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with you in mind because it's simple to use. Why would someone want to use a VPN? I had asked myself the same question several months ago. Now keep in mind, I would never suggest that anyone use a VPN to do anything illegal on the internet. Don't go out there Googling crazy stuff. Don't go out there breaking the law, but we do all have a right to a little bit of privacy on the internet before we find ourselves living in George Orwell's 1984. In March of 2019, the Senate voted to permit internet providers to sell customers' browsing history without their permission or their knowledge. Websites like Google, Amazon, and Facebook track your every move on and sometimes offline. Every week we read news stories about this company or that one being hacked, compromising sensitive user data including financial information. I'm not here for it, guys. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here for it, guys. I don't want it. I take a hard pass. With Surfshark VPN, you can protect your privacy by hiding your real IP address using industry-leading encryption. This is especially important when you're using a public Wi-Fi where all your browsing activity is visible to anyone nearby who knows where to look for it. I used to work for Verizon, and customers would always ask me, why do I have to be careful on public Wi-Fis? And I would tell them, you know, we have a big tech technology school nearby where we live. And literally a college student going to one of these schools will know how to hack into your computer or your device while you're on a public Wi-Fi if they're in the same area as you. Surfshark has a strict no logs policy. They don't monitor, track, or store what you do online at all. And even if you're not concerned about your privacy while online, I know we're all spending a lot more time watching Netflix lately. Surfshark's no borders mode allows you to access your own Netflix account while traveling in different countries. And it also allows you to access other countries' Netflix where they have different programming that's not available yet in the US. I'm a big fan of BBC programming and I'm always having to wait for my favorite shows like Peaky Blinders to make their way across the pond, but I don't have to wait anymore. And I've also exhausted the current offering on you know, US Netflix. So I, I really like seeing what other countries have to offer. And I found a lot, a lot of cool new shows. Whatever your internet concern is, Surfshark has the answer. Now you can browse the internet safely, keep your passwords and banking information safe, keep your private pictures and messages safe, and keep your peace of mind intact. If you're interested in protecting your privacy and freedom on the internet, click the link in the description box and get 85% off a two-year plan plus an additional three months for free or go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow. This special offer makes your subscription just $1.77 a month. Best of all, a Surfshark subscription doesn't cover just one of your devices or even two of your devices. It covers all of them, giving you protection and privacy on an unlimited number of devices at once. So you can put it on your kids' tablets, you can put it on your husband's computer, you can put it on your mom's phone. It's amazing, it's amazing, check it out. I love it, I will never not use a VPN ever again. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and thank you so much to all of you out there who continue to support me, watch my videos, and support the sponsors that we talk about. Let's get on with the video. Okay, so when we last left off, Melinda and Tony and Hope and Lori had all done their dirty deed and then they went to McDonald's to have breakfast. So while Melinda Loveless, Lori Tackett, Hope Rippey, and Tony Lawrence were all sitting in that McDonald's, 
after brutally taking the life of a 12 year old girl, a girl that none of them had even ever met before that night besides Melinda, they made a pact, a pact of silence. They promised each other that they would never speak of the events of the past hours to anyone else. Yet when they all parted ways, very few of them ended up sticking to that pact of silence. That afternoon, Melinda and Lori went to Melinda's house, and while Lori watched television, carefree as could be, Melinda made some calls. Her first call was to her friend, Crystal Wathan, a 15-year-old girl who had been close to Melinda since they were five years old in kindergarten. According to Crystal, Melinda was crying when she confessed that Shanda was dead, and Crystal promised to come right over. Melinda also called Amanda Heverin, the girl who unknowingly was at the center of this tragic event, but Amanda's father said she wasn't home. She was at the mall. When Crystal arrived, she found Melinda a sobbing mess and Lori cuddled up on the couch in some blankets watching television with no expression whatsoever. Crystal was a pretty girl, well put together, self-confident, and Lori felt compelled to make a good impression on her. And apparently she thought she could make a good impression, by telling the entire story in all of its grotesque detail, leaving nothing out and at times laughing about it. Crystal, horrified, asked what Lori thought was funny, and Lori told her she no longer felt bad about killing Shanda. Let's be honest here, did she ever? Melinda was still desperate to speak to Amanda. So she called the River City Mall and asked the security office to page Amanda. When Amanda got on the phone, Melinda told her something terrible had happened and that she was on her way to pick her up. So Crystal, Lori, and Melinda all piled into Lori's car, the very same car that Shanda had been held prisoner in and tortured in just hours before. Melinda sat in the back seat, they got to the mall, and when a bewildered Amanda got in, Melinda just started hugging her and said, Shanda's dead. When they got back to Melinda's with Amanda, she brought Amanda upstairs to her room for privacy and told her, quote, I just wanted to beat her up, but Lori went crazy and killed her. At first, Amanda thought the girls were just playing some sick joke on her, trying to teach her a lesson for breaking Melinda's heart. But as the tears poured from her ex-girlfriend's eyes, Amanda realized that they were telling the truth. Shanda was dead, and Melinda and this girl Lori were responsible for it. When they returned downstairs, Lori wasted no time walking them all out to the car and showing off the blood stains that still remained in the trunk, like some twisted Price is Right model. Amanda felt nauseous and asked to be brought home, but Lori made sure to pull Melinda aside and question her on whether or not Amanda would turn them in, whether or not Amanda could be trusted. And Melinda assured her that her friends would never do that to her. Once again, I always wonder, was Lori asking Melinda this as in, you know, I'm worried about this or as in, if she can't be trusted, we've got to get rid of her as well. And Melinda must not have been completely confident that her friends would never do that to her because as they pulled up to Amanda's house, Melinda made sure to follow her out of the car and let Amanda know she couldn't tell anyone. Amanda promised she wouldn't, the two girls exchanged words of love and kisses, and Melinda got back in the car and drove away. According to Amanda, she went upstairs to her room, read a letter from Shanda, and cried. This Lori girl, man, I've been trying to hold back my disgust for her, but it's been very difficult. It's like she could just not get enough of what they had done. She had to relive it over and over again, like she was watching her favorite movie. She was the one who had threatened everyone to remain silent, but the murder was all she wanted to talk about. After they left Amanda's house, they drove to Taco Bell and they went inside to eat. And when they walked back to the car, they could hear a rock song that was playing in the car. Now, it was coming from a boombox. I guess Lori's um, car stereo didn't work, or maybe she didn't have one. So what she did was she got just like a boombox and put it in the car, and that's what they had stolen the batteries for that night at Walmart, the night that they, that they killed Shanda. So Lori kept this boombox in the back seat, and as they're walking towards the car, they hear the music playing, and Lori put on this show. She stared at the other girls open-mouthed, and she said, this must be Shanda's spirit trying to contact us since I turned off the radio before we went inside Taco Bell, and this had been one of the songs 
that I was singing the night before while I was torturing Shanda. Lori said they should have a seance and see if they could communicate with Shanda from the other side. So we've got Lori in the driver's seat, Crystal is in the passenger seat, and Melinda's in the back. Lori pulls out the tire iron that she'd used to beat Shanda with the night before, and she once again started waving it around. According to Crystal, getting a glazed look in her eye as if remembering something from a very long time ago. And then she said, quote, I can remember how it felt when it was going into her head. When I was hitting her, it was really taking hunks out of her head, end quote. She then began to strike the dashboard of her car with the tire iron to illustrate what she had done to Shanda, and then she tried to place the weapon under Crystal's nose, demanding that she smell it. As they drove, Lori would suddenly yelp and like yell out and say, shadows keep jumping out at me, they're coming to get me. It seems like someone saw the movie Ghost just way too many times. When they got back to Melinda's house, Melinda begged Crystal to stay the night. Apparently earlier when they'd been at Lori's house, Lori had told her father that she was spending the night at Melinda's and she did this without asking Melinda and she did it in front of Melinda. So what was Melinda really supposed to say when Lori was telling her father that she was gonna spend the night at Melinda's and Melinda was right there and she hadn't previously agreed to it? But anyways, Melinda obviously didn't want to be alone with Lori that night. But after being with Lori all day, Crystal was not wanting to be alone with Lori either, or Melinda for that matter. She certainly wasn't going to fall asleep in the same house as those maniacs, so she left. Melinda and Lori weren't the only ones breaking the code of silence. Tony had already called her friend from the McDonald's, and this friend had promised Tony that she would help her get a lawyer. All day while Tony was at work selling people curly fries at Arby's, she just couldn't stop thinking about the previous night. She was also afraid, so she says, that once Melinda and Lori talked and realized that she hadn't been an active participant, they would try and take her out too. Finally, her boss was like, you don't look good, are you sick? You need to go home but her parents weren't home to give her a ride, so she called Hope Rippy. Apparently, Hope was feeling anxious as well. I'm not sure if Hope was feeling guilty about what had happened to Shanda or if she, like Tony, was worried for her own safety after witnessing what Lori and Melinda were capable of. The two girls decided to go to the bowling alley where they knew a lot of kids who hung out there, older boys who would be able to intervene if Lori and Melinda came looking for them brandishing tire irons. As soon as they walked in, they recognized two friends from school and immediately confessed everything. I mean, it wasn't immediate. The boys were like, hey, you guys look upset. And then they confessed everything. Now these two boys that they confessed everything to, they were in shock, but they told Hope and Tony, like, you guys have to go to the police. There's really no way around it. And Hope and Tony were like, yeah, it's the right thing to do. You guys are right. But instead of going to the police, Hope brought Tony back to her house and exhausted, they fell asleep. But when the phone rang a short time later, Tony answered it to find that it was a lawyer. The lawyer that her friend had promised her earlier to contact for her, and this lawyer was named Daryl Oxier. He had already been apprised of the situation and his legal advice was go tell your parents, not now, but right now. And they did. First, they told Hope's parents, then Tony's. Now, Hope's parents decided, after also talking to this Daryl lawyer guy, that it wasn't in their child's best interest to go to the police. Instead, they would take her to a motel and keep low for a day or so. Tony's parents knew that the right thing to do was to go to the police and tell them everything. Maybe Shanda was still alive, and if there was a chance she could be saved, they couldn't pass it up. And to me, this really illustrates the difference in the end between Tony Lawrence and the other three girls. It's one thing if these teenage girls are afraid to go to the police. It's another thing when the parents get involved and the parents say, Ugh, we're not gonna go to the police because we're worried more about our kid getting into trouble than possibly saving the life of another child. The police had already been contacted by those two brothers who were going out bird hunting and had come upon Shanda's body. 
First at the gruesome scene back at Lemon Road was Jefferson County Sheriff Richard Shipley. Madison was a small, quiet town. They didn't have a lot of crime, and they certainly didn't have a lot of homicides. Shipley immediately realized that this investigation would be a bit out of his league. They'd need forensics and more police officers on the job than his small department could provide, so he called the state police. This call reached Steve Henry, a friend of Shipley's and an Indiana State Police detective based out of Sellersburg, about 40 miles west of Madison. He and a lab technician, Curtis Well, headed right over to the scene. They knew it was going to be bad, but until they were standing over the charred remains of Shonda Scherer, they didn't know how horrible it would truly be. Her body was in the pugilistic stance, which we've touched on in other videos, such as the Isdell woman's case for Halloween. It's characterized by the knees and elbows being flexed and the arms raised in the air with fists clenched. It's a sign that someone has been set on fire while still alive. They thought that this young woman was either in her teens or 20s, and of course, they sensed that there was foul play involved, but they figured she'd been kidnapped by some predator, an older man perhaps. They could never in a million years have guessed that this was done to her by other young girls. Shipley got on the police radio and sent a message out to the surrounding areas to keep an eye out for missing persons reports for a young woman in her late teens to mid 20s. They made plaster casts of the footprints and tire tracks in the immediate area, knowing that Lemon Road had just been regraveled three days prior. They collected the burned fragments of red fabric and a melted plastic bottle as the messages of local missing persons came over the radio. From what they could tell, none of these missing persons looked like the body that was in front of them. Steve Henry was frustrated and disgusted. What kind of monster would do this to someone, much less someone so young? He'd been involved in many homicide investigations, but this was his first one as lead detective, and he made a silent promise to this mystery girl, laying alone in the road, that he would do all he could to bring her attacker to justice. As the sun disappeared beneath the surrounding soybean fields, investigators set up lights so they could continue working into the night and not miss even the smallest clue. After seven hours, an ambulance arrived to take Shanda's body away to the morgue at King's Daughters Hospital in Madison. Now, even if Tony and her parents had not gone to the police, these girls had told so many people, it was pretty much a given that at least one of them would have. After leaving the scene, the officers got some dinner and headed to the Jefferson County Police Station to do their required paperwork, but they were interrupted by a man and his teenage son who claimed to have information about a murder. This teenage boy was Sean Piles, one of the boys who had been at the bowling alley when Tony and Hope had been there earlier that evening spilling their guts. Sean told Steve Henry that two girls he knew claimed two girls that they knew had killed and burned a little girl that morning in a field in the country. Sean said the two girls he had talked to were named Tony Lawrence and Hope Rippey. As this was happening, a call came into the Jefferson County Police Station from the Madison Police Station saying they had another teenager there, a young girl named Tony Lawrence, who also had information about a murder. Steve Henry directed them to leave the Madison station and come right over. Now, Tony wasn't completely truthful when she gave her statement to Steve Henry. She said that she knew the girl who was 13 and her name was Shanda, but she didn't know what her last name was. Tony told them pretty much everything, but she left out the part where she and Hope were present there on Lemon Road. Tony said that Melinda and Lori had already dropped them off at home before this happened. Now the police officers knew due to the timeline of when Shanda's body had been discovered a bit after 10 a.m. and when Tony claimed to have been dropped off at 9.45 a.m., this really couldn't possibly be true unless Melinda and Lori were the original Valo Daybell duo and had figured out how to teleport around town. She didn't know Shanda's last name, right? But a name Tony did know? It sounded familiar to the law enforcement officials that sat around listening to her story. Lori Tackett. Sheriff Shipley was familiar with a George Tackett who had a criminal record and he thought George might have a daughter in her teens. 
He'd never heard the name Melinda before, but he wouldn't since she lived in New Albany, according to Tony. So he placed a call to the chief probation officer, Virgil C.A., who worked in Floyd County. This was the same probation officer that Amanda's father had brought Melinda's letters to months ago. Letters that he thought were inappropriate sexually, but letters that also said Melinda would like to see Shanda dead. They sent another police officer, Deputy Randy Spry, to pay Lori Tackett a visit. She wasn't home, but her parents said she was spending the night with a friend in New Albany, a friend named Melinda. Now, they still didn't have Melinda's last name, but that was cleared up pretty quickly when probation officer Virgil returned their call. And he informed them that a girl named Melinda Loveless had been brought to his attention a few months ago, when the father of another girl had made a complaint against her and produced several inappropriate letters written by Melinda to his then 14-year-old daughter, Amanda. While this was all going on, Curtis Wells, the lab technician, had been poring over the missing persons reports from that day. They had originally thought that Shanda was in her late teens or early 20s, but Tony had told them that she was 13. So now they had to refine their search and look at different missing persons reports. And they found one for a 12-year-old named Shanda Scherer, who had last been seen by her father at 11.30 on Friday night. The address on the report matched the address that Tony Lawrence had given them when asked where they picked the murdered girl up from. State troopers were sent over to Melinda Loveless's house and they camped out in front of the house with their eyes on Lori's car. They didn't have the arrest warrants yet or the warrants to search the car or the home, so Steve Henry told them, you know, just hang there, watch, make sure these girls don't try to leave, while he sent his older brother, Howard Henry, who was also a detective in Salisbury, to the house of Stephen Scherer in Jeffersonville to notify the parents that their daughter had been found, but she was no longer alive. I can't imagine how difficult it is to have to be the one to tell two frantic parents that their missing daughter is never coming home. I give police officers a lot of credit for having to notify family members of these kinds of things every day. It would break me. Shanda's mother, Jackie, had just gone home to get some rest 30 minutes before Howard Henry arrived at Stephen Scherer's doorstep. And Steve was confused when Henry said he'd really like both of them there before asking about Shanda's jewelry, clothing, and dental records. When Jackie finally arrived, Howard informed them sadly that someone had taken Shanda's life. As the two parents crumbled into the realization that they would never see their daughter again, and Howard Henry tried his best to comfort them, his brother, Steve Henry, had his hands on the warrants and was headed for New Albany and the home of Melinda Loveless. According to the arresting officers, Lori Tackett never let her tough girl act falter, not even for a moment. Not when she was told she was under arrest, to which she responded, are we on candid camera? Not when the cuffs were firmly fastened onto her wrists? Not when she was sitting in the passenger seat next to Steve Henry, casting threatening glares at him, which he described as the kind of stare that makes the hair on the back of your neck tingle. When they arrived at the police station, Melinda looked like she was going to faint and she went back and forth between crying and staring blankly at the wall, but Lori never shed a tear. Don't feel too badly for Melinda, though. She may have been outwardly more upset than Lori, but her initial reaction was that of self-preservation, whispering to her mother on the phone that all she had wanted to do was scare Shanda, but someone else had a knife and went too far. Shanda had been picked up from her father's home by these girls who meant to do her harm late on the evening of January 10th. She was tortured for most of that night and the next morning, and she was set on fire early on the morning of January 12th. By 8.30 that evening, the police already had their suspects and were rushing to get warrants for their arrests, and by 4 a.m. on January 12th, Melinda and Lori were in custody. A few hours later, Shanda arrived at the office of Dr. George Nichols, Louisville's chief medical examiner and an expert when it came to working with burn victims. It was lucky that Nichols was so close by since his reputation for identifying badly burned bodies preceded him. Shanda had just been to the dentist the month before so she could be fitted for braces. Her dental records matched. Now that she had been positively identified, the next step was to determine her cause of death. 
Her head and torso were covered with third and fourth degree burns. There were rope marks on her forearms and ankles and a puncture wound at the base of her neck. Nichols also found three lacerations on her scalp and these appeared to be from a blunt weapon. Something that none of these girls had revealed was the fact that Shanda appeared to have been sodomized by a blunt cylindrical object which had been inserted three and a half inches inside of her. Due to the extent of her internal bleeding, Nichols believed this had happened while Shanda was still alive. The inside of her throat was covered with black soot, further proof that she had been set on fire while still alive and breathing. George Nichols believed that although her wounds were extensive and serious, she may have been able to recover if she'd been given proper medical attention, and he listed her cause of death as being due to smoke inhalation and severe burns. Dr. George Nichols had seen it all. He'd directed the autopsies of 163 people killed in a restaurant fire in Owensboro, Kentucky. He'd performed autopsies on 23 church members killed in a fiery bus crash. But even he said that Shanda's case was absolutely gruesome. Her body was in such bad shape, her parents couldn't even dress her for the funeral. And there would certainly not be an open casket. Instead, they placed her favorite blue jeans and sweatshirt beside her in the casket and covered her with a blanket of roses. Shanda's murder literally rocked small town Madison. Residents could not believe that something like that could have taken place in their sleepy tree-lined streets. One woman who worked for the Chamber of Commerce said in disbelief, our policemen and firemen usually rescue cats from trees. Now, you had four young girls, Melinda, 16, Lori, 17, Hope and Tony, both 15, three of them Madison residents, who had orchestrated the brutal murder of a 12-year-old girl. And as it does in small, sleepy towns, the rumor mill got to churning. Ron Grossman from the Chicago Tribune would later visit the town along with many other news outlets and write, The age of innocence here ended at about 10.45 a.m. last January 11th on a dirt road 15 miles out of town. He compared it to the notorious Leopold and Loeb case from 1924. Many of these reporters who came from bigger cities and considered themselves more advanced felt that the townspeople were trying to push the blame off of the girls themselves and blame the devil. One of these locals, Carol Fisher, told USA Today reporter Andrea Stone, quote, Satanism is connected to this. I don't think teenage girls are capable of doing what they did on their own. People are just amazed and shocked at their age and their being girls. Good golly, people aren't born that mean. End quote. British journalist Richard Grant also took a trip across the pond to visit Madison, and he concluded that the problem with Madison was the problem with any small town. There was nothing to do. He wrote, quote, Life is a constant battle against boredom, in which alcohol and cannabis are the most dependable allies. Almost without exception, the girls wear heavy makeup and have permed, teased, and frosted hairstyles. 80% of them are fiercely blonde. They marry young and divorce young. They dream about escaping Madison, but seldom make it past Louisville. End quote. Kind of a harsh generalization there, Richard Grant, but okay. It's funny because I can't imagine anybody on cannabis to go out and do what these girls did. In fact, I feel like maybe if they'd smoked a little bit more weed, they may have been a lot more chill and maybe just been at home eating chips and watching movies instead of going out and murdering people. But we have to remember, it was the, the early 1990s. Everybody still thought that, that weed was the gateway drug and caused you to be a violent murderer. It had been decided that Melinda and Lori would be charged as adults due to the violent nature of the crime, and we'll talk about why I believe they made that decision a bit later on. The county prosecutor, Guy Mannering Townsend, he made an effort to prevent the release of official information early on, but small pieces here and there leaked and spread, of course. People whispered to each other that the girls were lesbians and devil worshippers. They'd heard that these girls drank each other's blood and performed ritual sacrifices. And the media, sensing the blood in the water, descended on the town and its surrounding areas. When Steve Scherer arrived home from making arrangements for his daughter's funeral, the news vans were already waiting, shoving microphones in his face as he tried to get past them into the safety of his house. I cannot express enough in all of these videos that I hate the mainstream media. I think they're vultures. I think they're disrespectful. They have no care or concern for anybody's privacy or feelings. 
It's disgusting. The media knocked on the doors of neighbors hoping to get something, anything, a sound bite about the 12-year-old girl that they could run with for the evening news. They stayed outside the Sharer home all day and into the evening until they packed it up for the day only to return the next morning. What the media didn't know and could only speculate on was the motive for why Shanda had died. So instead of reporting facts or waiting for actual information to be released, they reported on whatever gossip they could pick up on. A lesbian love triangle, a satanic cult. Viewers around the nation watched the news with shock and disgust and horror, wondering, could this happen in their towns too? The police report was released the same afternoon of Shanda's autopsy, giving bare bones details about Shanda being killed because of jealousy. Melinda Lovelace had thought Shanda was trying to steal her girlfriend, Amanda. All four girls' full names were available in the report, including Hope Rippey, who still had not emerged from her motel hideout. Some family members of the girls gave interviews to the relentless reporters, and they pretty much all said the same thing. Not my daughter, not my sister. There must be some mistake or some misunderstanding here. At Shanda's funeral, the reverend read a poem. God made the world with towering trees, majestic mountains, and restless seas. And then he paused and he said, it needs one more thing, something to touch and dance and sing. So God made little girls. When he completed that task he had begun, he was pleased. For the world seen through little girl's eyes greatly resembles paradise. The Reverend looked up from these words into the eyes of Jackie and Steve and said, Your beloved Shanda now lives in paradise. She was buried in the town of Big Springs, Kentucky, finally laid to rest next to her grandmother. The peace that Jackie and Steve felt after the funeral would be short-lived as the media began to speculate how Shanda's parents could have let her get so wrapped up in this dark world because it is always the media's first reaction to blame the parents. And although I do think in a lot of cases that's correct, I would wholeheartedly say in the case of Lori and Melinda and even Hope that we could blame the parents. In Shanda's case, blaming her parents for allowing her to affiliate with these girls is the equal of blaming the victim. There was still a lot of work for law enforcement to do before the case went to trial. Steve Henry had to determine exactly how involved the other two girls, Hope and Tony, had been. He'd sensed right off the bat that Tony wasn't being completely honest, so he began to investigate her timeline. He went to the gas station where Tony had said that Lori and Melinda purchased the gasoline right before dropping her and Hope off at home. She'd claimed that they were dropped off at 9.45, but he could find no record of a two liter of Pepsi and gas being purchased at that exact station between 9.15 and 9.30. He did find, however, that the purchase had actually taken place at 8.40 in the morning, a full hour before Tony claimed to have been brought home. Steve Henry then retraced the steps of the girls to see how long it would take to do everything Tony had claimed. The next morning, he went to that same gas station. He purchased a bottle of Pepsi and the same amount of gas. He then went to the area on Lemon Road where Shanda had been found. He went around to the back of his car, opened the trunk, and stayed there for a few minutes before driving to the McDonald's where the girls had all had breakfast that fateful morning. He bought himself a coffee and he looked at his watch. It was 9.30 in the morning. This was how he confirmed that Tony's timeline had been invented by her to hide the fact that she and Hope had both been there on Lemon Road when Shanda was burned. When Shanda's body had been found, it was already cold, and he knew that Melinda and Lori could not have gotten the gas, driven the other girls home, and returned to Lemon Road in such a short time, much less have completed this with enough time for Shanda's body to cool down when it was discovered shortly after 10. The only problem was he couldn't really confront Tony with his theory now and his findings since her parents had decided that uh, Tony wouldn't be speaking to the police any longer. But what about Hope? Her parents had hired this Daryl Oxier attorney and Daryl had told the police he'd be bringing her in for an interview soon, but he hadn't yet. And the police figured out that this Daryl guy was just trying to buy some time and saying that Hope wasn't ready to give an official statement yet. She was too upset. She, she couldn't bring herself to do it yet. And basically, you know, they were just buying time for her. So for the time being, without Tony and Hope's cooperation, the police pretty much just had to work on figuring out what happened. Forensic 
forensics had been run on the weapons that had been recovered. A knife found on Lori when she'd been arrested, the kitchen knife, which had been found on the side of the road, but these two knives had no traces of blood on them. Apparently, there were no fingerprints found in the trunk of the car either, or on the tire iron that Lori had been waving under everybody's noses, telling them to smell it. They did, however, find blood in the trunk that matched Shanda's, as well as cloth fibers that matched the burned blanket found with Shanda. They brought Amanda and her parents, who had already lawyered up, into the station for an interview. Amanda admitted that Melinda had been jealous of Shanda, but denied that there was any sort of romantic relationship between any of them. And obviously, in my opinion, she was not admitting that because her parents were present. So after talking to her, Steve Henry felt it was pretty obvious that Amanda was trying to protect Melinda and cast all the blame on Lori, most likely because that's what Melinda had tried to convince her of, and maybe because there was still fragments of loyalty for a girl that she had once claimed to love. Steve Henry said, quote, I think she felt that now Shanda was gone, she had to stick by Melinda. She had no one else, end quote. But since they were in possession of the letters Melinda had written to Amanda, courtesy of probation officer Virgil C.A., the police not only knew that Amanda was lying about there being no romantic entanglements, but that Melinda was also incredibly jealous of Shanda to the point of hating her and wanting her dead. Now previously, Tony had also mentioned the names Larry and Terry Leatherberry, to the police, saying that when Lori started hanging out with these two boys, she became very weird and that they would sometimes drink each other's blood. So when Larry Leatherberry called the police station insisting he had information, Steve Henry and Richard Shipley drove out to Louisville to talk to him. Larry pretty much just wanted to give his alibi before they came knocking at his door for it, knowing that he was associated with Lori Hackett, knowing his name had most likely already been involved. Steve Henry also got the impression that Larry thought it was really cool to like be a part of this and talking to the police and giving his statement. I think Steve Henry even said it appeared Larry was really enjoying himself while talking to the police and kind of spilling all the tea and saying everything that he knew. Because what he really wanted to tell the police was all about Lori and her dark side, her fascination with the occult, her tendency to paint pictures with her own blood. He told the detectives that for some time Lori had been obsessed with death and that she had always talked about wanting to perform a human sacrifice. She also always spoke to him about burning someone. The police already knew what Lori and Melinda had done for the most part and they could place Shanda in the trunk of Lori's car. What they needed now was to build a case for premeditation. Melinda had told everyone that she'd only wanted to threaten Shanda, scare her a bit, and that it was Lori who had taken it too far. But due to her letters and testimony from Melinda's friends, it seemed Melinda had been talking about ending Shanda's life for quite a while before it actually happened. For instance, Melinda's friend, Carrie Pope, had been brought to the police's attention by Larry Leatherberry, so they brought her in. Steve Henry asked her how often Melinda talked about killing Shanda, and Carrie replied, almost every day. Then Carrie told him how Melinda was always asking to be brought to Shanda's house so they could beat her up. Then Carrie spoke about Lori, saying that when she'd met her, Lori seemed normal and that she'd even liked her. They were very close. And I know this is all confusing, all of these names. Carrie was a lesbian friend of Melinda's and they both were introduced to Lori at about the same time. But then remember, Carrie and Melinda had gotten into a fight and they stopped talking. And then Melinda began hanging out with Lori and according to Carrie, Melinda's friend, when Melinda started hanging out with Lori after telling everyone that she wanted Shanda dead for months, she already knew that Lori was telling everybody that she would enjoy killing someone. Carrie claimed, quote, Lori had said it was her destiny to kill somebody and hear them screaming. She just talked like that, you see. Lori doesn't keep friends for a very long time. When she makes a friend, she'll lie to them. She'll steal for them. She'll do anything to keep that friend. When I stopped hanging out with her, she told people she was going to put a death spell on me. She'd call me up and disguise her voice and threaten me. Melinda told me if she had a chance, she would kill Shanda. Lori was the type of person that would probably help just to keep her as a friend. Carrie elaborated, claiming that Lori had told the Leatherberry brothers that it was her dream, basically, to trip on acid and kill someone and then not remember it the next morning. She would cut herself in front of people and then say how much she would love to do that to someone else. She said she wanted to stick a knife in someone's stomach just to see what it felt like. Then Carrie admitted that Lori actually really scared her, saying, quote, I know some people say that people can't control your mind, but she influenced me a lot, and I believe she had a hold of my mind." End quote. 
Carrie felt that Lori would do and say these things to get attention because her parents hated who she was and wouldn't give her any attention. Lori had become so disconnected from reality that she didn't care what happened. She didn't care if she died. She didn't care if she went to prison. She didn't care if she went to hell. She didn't care about anything except feeling good in the moment. And Carrie claimed she actually believed Lori was possessed by something or someone. Carrie told the police if she could speculate on what had happened that night, it would be that Melinda had made the comment to Lori that she wanted to kill Shanda and Lori had said, let's go, let's do it. Carrie didn't feel that Melinda had taken Lori seriously because underneath the tough girl act, Melinda did have a good heart and she wasn't even the one who'd set Shanda on fire. She wouldn't do that. When they asked Carrie who did set Shanda on fire, Carrie responded that it had been Lori and Hope, and she knew this because Melinda had called her from jail and told her so. Melinda had claimed that while this was happening, she and Tony were behind the car, burning evidence. Melinda told Carrie she didn't even know what was happening until she saw Lori drop the match. All Melinda had done was beat Shanda up and burn evidence. Not great, but certainly not on par with what Lori had done. Hope and Tony were still not talking and January was drawing to a close, so Steve Henry began visiting the other places the girls had been that night. He found no trace of them at the witch's castle, but on the dirt road near the Tackett's house, he found a pair of small shoes by the side of the road. They were Shanda's shoes that her mother had given her the past Christmas. He also, at that point, talked to Ace Newman and Michael Starkey, the boys who had seen Lori at the Tackett's burn pile from the window of their trailer the night of Shanda's abduction. They confirmed that Lori had been there and that she had seemed upset and nervous. Now, while Steve Henry was in the area, he decided to pay a visit to the Tackett's so he could look into Lori's room and kind of get an idea of what kind of girl she was. He'd gotten all this information about how she was obsessed with the occult and she had all of these dark magic books, so he kind of wanted to see this for himself. But Lori's mother had gone on a cleaning spree in the days after her daughter's arrest and had thrown everything out. The police had been able to prove through Melinda's letters that she and Amanda were having a relationship that was of a sexual nature, but they still had not been able to prove a relationship between Shanda and Amanda until Jackie found something in Shanda's closet. It was a shoebox clearly hidden, and on the top, Shanda had written, For my eyes only, please do not open. Inside, there was a neat pile of letters. Shanda had kept every single letter that she'd received from Amanda and the two that she'd gotten from Melinda. The letters clearly painted a very different picture than Amanda had shown to the police. So armed with this new evidence, Steve Henry went to talk to Amanda again. According to Steve Henry, armed with these letters, Amanda could no longer deny that there had been something going on, but he said, quote, she wasn't very helpful to us. It was like she was bored during the whole interview. She just kept looking at the clock and telling her father she was going to be late to basketball practice, end quote. As the police force were working on gathering evidence, the prosecution was trying to figure out how they were going to handle this case. Firstly, there was a matter of jurisdiction. Shanda had been abducted from Clark County, but the murder had happened in Jefferson County. It was decided by the prosecutors from both counties that Guy Townsend, chief prosecutor in Jefferson County, would take the lead. No one really wanted to take the case. Nobody wanted to really try the case because it was very possible it could turn into a death penalty case and no matter what these girls had done, people felt that, you know, they're still kids. No one wanted that job of building a case against them if that was going to be their eventual end. Now in Indiana, the death penalty is available only for the crime of murder, and then only if the prosecution can prove the existence of at least one of 17 aggravating circumstances, one of these being that the murder was especially heinous, atrocious, cruel, or depraved, or involved torture, which I think we can all agree, the murder of Shanda Shara checks all of these boxes. Before 1987, the age to be eligible for the death penalty was 10, but that year it was raised to 16, and in 2002 it was raised again to 18. However, this was 1992, so both Melinda and Lori were technically eligible for the death penalty. I read in the book, Little Lost Angel by Michael Quinlan, that when Townsend first laid his eyes on Melinda, he thought she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen, which I personally think is a really creepy thing to say about a 16 year old girl when it's coming from a man in his 50s, but that's just my opinion, don't come for me, just, just my opinion, creepy. He went on to say that he might have trouble convincing a jury to convict her because she was that attractive. 
Both Melinda and Lori, who came from poorer families, were assigned public defenders, and Lori's attorney, Robert Barlow, within no time was notifying the court that he would most likely be seeking an insanity plea for his client. She was scheduled for a psychological evaluation at the Indiana State Women's Prison to determine if she was mentally competent to stand trial. Here's what that report said. Mary Laureen Tackett is a bright, articulate adolescent whose intellect is clear and unimpaired. Her spelling is near perfect, and she has very high social intelligence and communication skills. She is probably without any intellectual, perceptual, or cognitive impairment due to any genuine psychosis. She is very anxious about her circumstances and her future and feeling hopeless and doomed. She is seeking rescue with a strong sense of desperation and in inventing and enumerating every symptom she can think of or have ever heard of. She spoke most typically in a low, expressionless monotone without making eye contact. She appeared sad and anxious most of the time and animated and enthusiastic only when discussing her beliefs in her psychic powers and various aspects of her New Age philosophy, which appears to be a combination of spiritualism and hippieism left over from the 1960s with a heavy emphasis on ESP. Okay, so we're going to get back to the report in a minute, but this report did determine that Lori had an IQ of 110, which is above average. She also had received counseling for a month in June of 1991 and had been prescribed Prozac, which she took until the prescription ran out. It was never refilled. She claimed she had been physically abused by both her parents and tormented at school for being different. At one point, she told her doctor she had no memories before the age of 10 or 11, but then later she told him that she clearly remembered having hallucinations at the age of 2. Her hallucinations included millions of moving dots, Mickey Mouse, a tall elf man who looked like a cricket. Anyone can be a fool and do things which are wrong. But a figure that resembled Cousin It from the Adams Family <laughs> and UFOs. She also claimed to hear demonic voices telling her to come with them, and these voices would talk to her every few days, sometimes instructing her to hurt her family and friends. Once again, even though she claimed to have no memories before the age of 10, she later vividly remembered being sexually assaulted by a cousin when she was four, and a neighbor when she was six, and another neighbor when she was nine, and another neighbor when she was 16. She claimed to have a lot of different people living in her head, and she went on to name and describe all of these personalities who occupied her head, each appearing after the alleged abuse took place. But the appearance of these personalities did not always coincide in her story with the ages she claimed to have been assaulted. She said Sissy appeared when she was three, Sarah appeared when she was four, Darlene when she was nine, Gino, a male personality, when she was 15, and Deanna the Vampire had appeared when she was 16. According to Lori, Darlene, Gino, and Deanna were all present at one point or the other during her attack on Shanda, but Lori herself was never there. Her doctor asked if one of her personalities could come out and, and talk with him. So Lori closed her eyes, and when she reopened them, she was 23-year-old Deanna the Vampire. This doctor wrote in the report, quote, she raised her face with a different expression and a degree of mischievousness which fit a prior description of this alter ego, but expressions and manner already observed in Lori continue to be seen. She reported that she was maintaining the personality's presence with effort and acted exhausted afterward. None of this behavior is typically reported in studies of multiple personalities. The professional conclusion of the doctors was that Lori was desperate to avoid conviction and a prison sentence and appeared quite willing to fabricate and exaggerate symptoms in order to support a defense of insanity and avoid prosecution as criminally responsible. She legitimately believed that if her normal personality, Lori, had not been there at the time of the murder, she couldn't be held responsible for what had happened. She was clearly a deeply disturbed girl, but she was not insane and could legally stand trial for her crimes. So basically, this report read her for filth. It was not a slam dunk, however. Melinda was going to point the finger at Lori, and Lori was going to point the finger at Dehenna the Vampire, and neither girl seemed to be close to being ready 
to accept responsibility for their part in the death of Shanda Shearer. Townsend, the lead prosecutor, he wasn't interested in putting on a dramatic show for the town, which a long and drawn out trial would surely become. They couldn't really afford it, it was gonna be expensive, and he didn't want their town to be known for this like three ring circus. His main goal was to finagle a plea deal so that they could put all this nasty business behind them and go back to being a small, safe town. Townsend would need the cooperation of Tony Lawrence and Hope Rippey in order to make this as quick and painless as possible, but as we know, neither of these two girls or their parents were being very cooperative at this point. And that is where we'll leave off for now. In the next and final part of this case, we'll find out how this all concluded, including Hope and Tony eventually being brought back into the picture and finding themselves under the microscope of the legal system for their part in the murder. We will also discuss what happened to all four girls and we'll also discuss whether or not their eventual punishment was fair. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, as always, to like the video if you liked it, to share the video if you think it's worth sharing. Head over to the comment section and let me know what you thought about this video. I love talking to you guys in there. Also, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Links in the description so you can stay up to date with what cases I'm covering or just what kinds of cases in the world I'm interested in at the time. And don't forget to check out the description box if you're interested in trying out Surfshark VPN. You can get 85% off a two-year plan plus an additional three months for free. So click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow. Thank you to all of you out there who keep coming back and watching these videos. I appreciate you so much. Thank you to my Patreons who literally make my life so much easier. It makes me feel like I have an actual friend group even though I'm very isolated and introverted and I don't have a lot of real friends that I talk to every day. So my Patreons are that for me and they also keep me sane a lot of the times. I appreciate them. Patreons, I appreciate you guys so, so, so much. I hope you all have an amazing day, but do think of Shanda as you go about your day. Remember her life, remember the beautiful young girl that she was, and remember that uh, there's a lot of crazy things going on out in the world, and, and be safe, okay? Be safe and keep your children safe too. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voices getting too loud All these feelings out of every It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say a Hail Mary Well you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood